started here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today it is really my absolute honor to introduce Dr. Michael Vogelbaum, the program leader of neuro-oncology and chief of neurosurgery at Moffitt Cancer Center. He's also the founder and chief medical officer of Infusion Therapeutics. Dr. Vogelbaum is really a leader in neurosurgical oncology and an innovator in our field. He began studying his career uh, in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins, going on to complete his MD and his PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia. He then completed his neurosurgical residency at Barnes Jewish Hospital, and from there began what really would be a remarkable career at the Cleveland Clinic. During the nearly two decades he spent there, he served as director of the Center for Translational Therapeutics and vice chairman of the Brain Tumor Institute, becoming full professor, full professor in our department in 2016. In 2019, Dr. Vogelbaum left the Cleveland Clinic to take his current role as Chief of Neurosurgery at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. From what I understand, the weather has really been a vast improvement from Cleveland. Dr. Vogelbaum is nationally recognized as a leader in both neurosurgery and neuro-oncology, leading numerous scientific committees with just a dizzying array of honors and awards and holding national and international leadership positions, as well as serving on editorial boards of numerous journals. Perhaps no, most notably, he's the founding co-chair of the Response Assessment in Neuro-Oncology, or RENO group, which has really transformed our approach to evaluating neuro-oncology outcomes. In addition to this incredibly busy clinical practice and his many leadership roles, he's had tremendous success as a clinical and translational physician scientist with research that is focused on malignant glioma. He's been the principal investigator on numerous clinical trials with really continuous funding for his work since, since 1996. Uh, which includes numerous NIH grants and current R01 funding. His work has resulted in multiple INDs, over 200 publications, textbooks, and numerous chapters and presentations. He really epitomizes not only the physician scientist, but uh, the role of an innovator, holding multiple patents for his work, uh, developing an FDA-approved convection-enhanced delivery device and system. In addition, he's mentored countless medical students, residents, and fellows over the years, uh, myself included. Uh, so it's uh, really an honor to have him. Uh, today, he'll be sharing his experiences, leveraging our role as surgeons to drive research and innovation. So with that, Dr. Vogelbaum, welcome. Well, thank you, Rupa, so much. And I think I'm going to have to play this recording for our faculty just to remind <laughs> them how lucky they are, right? No, you guys are the lucky ones. I, I think, Rupa, you know, you were, you were a terrific resident and, and it was so much fun to help uh, with your training and watch you grow. Uh, and uh, you know the folks uh, in New York are very lucky to have you. And I really appreciate this uh, invitation uh, to speak uh, to, to such a, a um, fantastic uh, group of, of neurosurgeons uh, uh, who I really admire. Uh, so, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the approach I've been taking in my career, um, starting as a, a traditional you know, neurosurgeon with laboratory uh, interest who wanted to develop a laboratory uh, in the traditional sense and recognized along the way that really one of the, one of the most productive laboratories that we have is the operating room and, and uh, in, the, in the course of, of developing uh, therapeutics. That's a role that we have that's unique uh, that others don't have and we're, we're, it really helps us to uh, leverage our role in, in advancing the science of brain tumors in my, exam, in my case, but uh, plenty of other areas of neurosurgery. So um, first, some disclosures. Um, uh, Rupa mentioned one of them, which is my interest in Infusion. Actually, the Cleveland Clinic owns Infusion. I have an indirect interest there. Um, and then there's some other uh, consulting and honoraria as noted. So um, whenever I talk about gliomas, um, this is a slide I always start with. Uh, and um, really, there's, there's over the course of a couple of decades of giving a talk like this, um, the only meaningful thing I've really changed on the slide is the date. And, um, and next month it's gonna say 2022, but the rest of the slide will largely be the same. Uh, and that's because the outcomes from gliomas and glioblastoma in particular remain quite dismal. Uh, and unlike other areas of cancer, we have not made quite so much progress. And the standard modalities that we've had over the past two decades remain the same. Uh, surgery to remove as much of the enhancing tumor as possible, radiotherapy to treat the infiltrative part, chemotherapy, uh, and then, you know, one of the newer things is alternating electrical fields, although that has some limited uh, uh, impact. And, and really, the only approved therapeutics for the past two decades for recurrent GBM do not extend survival. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. We have made a lot of progress in understanding the biology and subclassification 
of these tumors. Uh, and that seems to be a yearly advance, especially in the subclassification. But really, that's just slicing and dicing. It's, and it's important for understanding the biology, but it doesn't really change the outcomes. And that's where we are. So here are all the different approved agents uh, for, uh, for high-grade gliomas, starting with the ones that were grandfathered in the nitrose and ureas, and that was based upon response rate back uh, in the early days. And then of course, gliadel wafer, which really took the same drug, uh, one of the same drugs and, and delivered it locally and, and, and provide a, provided a small uh, survival benefit, but it was, it was enough uh, for an approval and, um, and really a nice proof of principle. Um, it wasn't until temozolomide came along that we started to see a little bit more survival benefit. We were able to actually combine that with radiotherapy. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so that was, that was an important approval in 2005 based upon survival. Then came along bevacizumab. Uh, and bevacizumab was approved in 2010 based upon uh, uh, response rate. Uh, but of course, as we know, uh, that response was, uh, was artificial. It was, it was uh, due to the fact that bevacizumab has an impact on our measure of response, which is enhancement um, independent of its effect on tumor. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and so that's, that, that actually uh, didn't show a survival benefit as I'll mention. And then of course the tumor treating fields as, as I mentioned in 2015 with survival uh, and a small, small benefit as well. Um, so when bevacizumab was, was, again, when it was looked at in a survival study, and I, I helped lead one of those studies, uh, one of the phase three studies, it did not show a uh, survival benefit. So the reality is the, the, the last drug to show a survival benefit was temozolomide in 2005. Uh, here we are in 2021. And then we have the tumor treating fields uh, that has sh also shown a survival benefit through mechanisms we don't fully understand. So what have been the successful agents? Well, cytotoxic chemotherapies. What has failed? Well, a lot of things. Signal transduction inhibitors, gene therapies, immunotherapies, anti-angiogenesis agents, brachytherapy, dose escalated radiotherapy, the list could go on. Uh, and, um, and, and this has been a real challenge. Uh, but I think what's, what's also challenging has been our approach to developing these therapies. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what, what I'm calling the cycle of futility in neuro-oncology. It starts with discovering a target. And, uh, and then of course we go on to validate the target using a variety of different standard models which have their limitations. Uh, we then develop a therapeutic against the target. Uh, and then we validate the therapeutic in preclinical studies, again, with some models that have some limitations to them. Um, but of course, once all that is promising, we go on and get the IND and perform uh, phase one studies unfortunately, usually with clinical endpoints only. Uh, and so we get a maximum tolerated dose and we have some uh, initial clinical results that look really promising. And then we go on and launch phase two studies uh, compared to quote unquote historical controls, uh, which have their own issues. Uh, and of course that leads to promising results, which often win many awards at the ANS CNS tumor section snow meetings. We've got more awards than then we have approved therapeutics. Uh, and of course, that next goes to a, a, a phase three trial, uh, which ultimately fails. And we say, well, the trial failure was because of a poor trial design, or maybe it was the wrong target, which takes us back into this cycle. And, th and that has been the nature of neuro-oncology uh, research for as long as, as I've, I've been involved in it, what I've seen. And, and I think if we're going to have, to have uh, progress, we have to really start learning from our failures. Uh, uh, Rupa alluded to my engineering background. One of the first things you learn as an engineer is uh, the, the, the concept of failure analysis. Uh, and, and you really have to spend time thinking through what went wrong, what were the different modes of failure, and start breaking it down. And, and, and that's, that's kind of the approach I've taken, and I, and I want to talk about that a bit. Um, so it starts with really trying to understand the disease. And, and I think that one of the fundamental challenges we have in our disease uh, is this, this issue of infiltrating tumor. Uh, a lot of our focus is on the tumor mass. Uh, and, um, and, and that's because that's what we could treat effectively with surgery. We can take out that tumor mass. But the reality is what kills the patient is this part, the part that's infiltrating around. Um, and, and that's where we fall down. 
Um, so what are the factors limiting progress? I alluded to infiltrative disease and our maximal safe surgery, which we talk about a lot, uh, have all sorts of great videos, uh, provide survival benefit, but it will never be a cure. Uh, and we start talking about super maximal resection and, uh, and, and you know, it's, in, in the end, we're gonna get to the same end, which is, which is we're not curing the disease. Um, the truth is we have limited technology for identifying areas that contain neoplastic cells. We usually refer to the T2 as part of the infiltrated tumor, but really it goes beyond that. Uh, and this was uh, uh, shown very nicely with, with uh, uh, genetic marker studies showing that you could see, you could find tumor cells very far away. Now this was of course a patient who succumbed to the disease, so it was very late stage, but even early stage, it's a distance away, it's beyond what we see on the T2. And the implications of this is that a complete resection of enhancing, or in the case of low-grade glioma, non-enhancing glioma, cannot be thought of as a curative procedure. Uh, and the same with supermaximal, as I alluded to. And, and this was a, a, actually a review, a, a systematic review that uh, a medical student uh, did with me um, a few years back, uh, where we really looked at this literature critically and showed that it was, was very lacking uh, in, in, uh, in, in sufficient data. Uh, so, what about this concept of genomic and epigenomic heterogeneity? Another very important uh, uh, idea that has been uh, under-discussed and under-investigated. Uh, and, and this is, you know, the first signal targeted uh, or targeted uh, agent that I really started working on was back in around 2001, 2002. It was one of the first EGFR inhibitors. And the idea was we could cure tumors, cancers in general, but even uh, GBM with, a, with an EGFR targeted agent uh, because it expresses, you know, EGFR amplification is one of the hallmarks of GBM and we have EGFR uh, B3 mutation, which is a very common one. Uh, so the idea was let's go ahead and start treating with targeted therapies. That's what's gonna cure this cancer. But, but the reality is what we're now learning 20 years later is that there is tremendous genomic and epigenomic uh, heterogeneity within these tumors uh, and this is nicely illustrated in a recent uh, Frontiers in Oncology article by, uh, that was led by Pedro Lowenstein, you know, showing that it's a very complex tumor microenvironment with, with yeah, there are tumor cells there, but there's so many other types of cells. There's, there's um, uh, elements for the immune system, other stromal elements, uh, and, and they all play a role in helping to sustain the tumor. Actually, the tumor either alters them or recruits them to help sustain the tumor. Uh, and, and in fact, if you start looking more deeply and start performing what, what you know, this integrative uh, analysis of tumor heterogeneity using different layers of information, uh, you know, at the histological level, at the molecular level, uh, you can, you can uh, start to understand that this is really a complex disease with many different subparts all within uh, one tumor. And this was uh, further illustrated uh, uh, by Mario Suva with this, with this really landmark article uh, that, that looked at the plasticity. Uh, so you could identify these four different groups uh, of, of GBM according to their uh, genomic signatures. But, but the reality is that they were fluid. They were moving between them. There's natural selection going on in every tumor. And so when you start looking them uh, by, the, by the classical TCGA subgroups, within each of the tumors, it's a mix. And yes, maybe you'll come up with a therapy that can knock off part of that mix, but then the other part survives, thrives, and expands. Uh, so this is not a single disease. There's not a single gene. Uh, targeted therapies uh, may not be the right answer here, uh, but it really wasn't until we started to go deep into um, these, these fundamental features uh, of GBM that we began to understand why maybe some of our studies were failing. Uh, that were too targeted. Uh, and then of course, there's this issue of poor access to therapeutics to the CNS. Um, it's, it's been estimated that more than 90% of potential neurotherapeutics cannot uh, access the nervous system. Uh, and, and of course, our preclinical models really have nothing to do with infiltrative disease. They are, they are just the enhancing solid tumor. Uh, and so, you know, and, and uh, you know, every time I read a paper uh, that that says uh, that, that where, where they gave a drug uh, to an animal with it with a, uh, a orthotopic xenograft tumor and said it, it gets into the brain when they just looked at tumor. I mean, that, that's not the brain. That's not the blood brain barrier. And, and I'll show some of those data. Um, so we really, in the end, for the most part, don't know why promising drugs failed. 
Uh, and that's, that's unfortunate because, you know, we're really not giving patients what they need, uh, which is a, a, a therapeutic that is much more likely uh, to work. So when we think about the failure of our trials, is it a failure to understand tumor biology or a failure to deliver? So to illustrate, um, uh, I'll start with the fact that there's a claim that a new drug crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it's made very frequently. Now the term is brain-penetrant drugs. So let's look at this carefully. So this, this actually started, and my interest in that started uh, actually before 2010, but this was a, a really nice, nice article uh, that looked at a new targeted therapy that was uh, reported as crossing the blood-brain barrier and highly efficient in suppressing the growth of intracranial GBM xenograft tumors. Um, looks really promising, right? So uh, I'm sure they got a nice grant from that. Um, and uh, another one uh, here that, that uh, you know, was in, in, in patients uh, where they were given this drug uh, and then the tumor was taken out and they looked for drug in the enhancing tumor. Nothing in the non-enhancing brain, just an enhancing tumor. So what do these have in common? Well, this tumor that's in a xenograft uh, it grows as an enhancing mass and there's really nothing else in the brain. So this is, this is actually work that I did uh, with a uh, rat model uh, of, of GBM. And these are, these are human tumors we implanted. Uh, we did extensive histological evaluations. I can assure you there's no infiltration from this site of disease. And, and this was, we did this in the setting of evaluating uh, one of the, at the time, new EGFR inhibitors, uh, which is now referred to as Tarceva uh, or allotment. Um, but at the time this was new and, and it was, uh, and it just had its uh, original name, which was OSI-774. Uh, and uh, we looked at both the uh, drug levels and uh, looked at uh, pharmacodynamic markers. So what, what it was doing to EGFR. Uh, and this is, this is what we showed. Uh, first of all, um, uh, when we look at uh, the tumor core, that is the enhancing tumor versus the brain around tumor versus the opposite hemisphere, uh, we can see that in the tumor core, the enhancing part, there was drug that was getting there. Uh, and of course, the brain around tumor looked suspiciously the same as the opposite hemisphere, where we knew there was no tumor at all. It wasn't getting into that part of the brain at any meaningful concentration. But there's another issue as well. And when we think about our clinical samples and taking, uh, taking tumor samples there, um, and, and that is uh, that um, uh, you, you're also sampling blood. And we know the drugs in the blood. Uh, and there are a number of ways that uh, uh, you know, pharmacologists will take, take into account the blood component. Those are all just models and they're pretty standard models, but they don't account for the actual vascular volume of, of a, any given tumor. Uh, so what we did was we perfused with saline. Uh, so these were the unperfused ones. These were the perfused ones. So we washed out the blood and took the tumor uh, really with the same timing. Uh, and showed that there was a meaningful drop in the concentration uh, when we removed blood from the equation. Uh, so when we think about drug getting in uh, with a, with a uh, you know, in a clinical sample, um, you're getting misled. It's an overestimate of what's actually in the tissue. Uh, and, um, and then of course, if it's not getting into the uh, 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 brain around tumor, well, it's not really getting into the blood brain barrier. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this is work that was done years ago, and uh, yet this is still going on. So these are some recent papers. So here was uh, um, a, 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 a relatively uh, recent drug, Viliparib, Viliparib which was a, a PARP inhibitor. Um, and, uh, and the evaluation of this started uh, actually outside of brain tumors. This was actually for uh, uh, a model of, of brain metastasis from breast cancer. And in this paper, the, the, this team said they evaluated the brain penetrance uh, of Liparib uh, in, uh, in uh, their model, um, but, but their actual measure was um, gadolinium. It's, it's, it's really kind of a strange study. They actually never really looked at the drug itself. They just said that, that um, gadolinium was getting in and they were using that as a surrogate. Very strange study, but that didn't prevent it from, from going on into uh, investigation for, for GBM. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, that um, there are a couple of remarkable things from this study here, uh, which said that the brain concentration, and they actually did look in brain, was about 0.47. So about 50% of the concentration that's in the blood, which was higher than other PARP inhibitors. Um, 
but it did note that glipirib actually is a substrate for the, uh, the, the, the molecules that pump drugs out of the brain, which is usually a bad sign when you're thinking about total drug exposure. Um, and also, the, the difference in glipirib compared to the other PARP inhibitors, uh, it gets in the brain more effectively, but it's actually less potent as a PARP inhibitor. That's actually um, uh, what's commonly seen when drugs are modified to get into the brain, they lose their native activity. Um, and, and, but but, but uh, that really didn't prevent it from going on to a clinical trial. So this was a large randomized phase two trial that was done uh, with Vilipirib, uh, and, uh, and it was called a brain penetrant PARP inhibitor, even though its penetrance wasn't really so good. Uh, and, um, and this is you know, it's a pretty typical clinical design, no real preclinical or, or uh, translational endpoints, uh, and here is the survival between the two arms. Really nothing remarkable, not a tremendous surprise. Um, and, and yet, you know, we're just doing this over and over. So now Viliparib is not so good, uh, even though it was the, the drug of the moment. That's not how drug development goes on in other areas of cancer. Um, this is how it goes on. You, you have a lot of pre, uh, uh, early clinical uh, evaluation of a drug, looking at both uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, markers. Uh, and, um, and one can say, you know, especially for something that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that can be biopsied uh, very easily, uh, if, it's a, if it's a melanoma, for example, or even, even some other, other, other uh, tumors, um, you, can, you can get CT guided biopsies much more easily than sampling a, a brain tumor. Um, but, but this is at the heart of drug development and drugs don't move forward without those data. Uh, but, we, but we're still doing this uh, in our field. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. So this was a study that David Reardon and I put together a number of years ago with a, with a new mTOR inhibitor, mTOR being part of the uh, EGFR signaling pathway. Um, and, um, and, and there were other mTOR inhibitors that were being developed. This is one that was being developed as an IV formulation. And so we had an opportunity uh, to sort of uh, uh, piggyback on a planned phase one study to start looking at questions of pharmacodynamics. Um, so it was a classical phase one study, but we collected tissue. We did pre-surgical dosing and we collected tissue after surgery. We do have some limitations with how we have to do it uh, in, in our field. We can't do the sample before surgery or after surgery, although I'll give you an example where we actually can. But in this study, we did. We used uh, the archival specimen. These were recurrent GBM patients. So we looked at a couple of downstream markers from mTOR and found that actually the surgical specimen, this new, new inhibitor, seemed to suppress uh, 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 phospho-SX uh, kinase, uh, which was a good sign, but it didn't really do anything to P27, which was a bad sign. And mTOR agents largely have not worked uh, uh, in GBM. But at least we had some indication here. Uh, and at that point, actually, when I saw these data and had an idea of, of this discrepancy, uh, and the signals, I said, you know, I'm not so sure I really want to invest a lot of my time in mTOR inhibitors anymore. Um, and, and, and I haven't, but, you know, other trials have, have gone on and they predictably failed. You know, this idea that we can do our trials more effectively is not a new idea. It is not my idea. Some of my best ideas were ones that I didn't come up with. Um, Fred Lang uh, actually um, uh, published this uh, many years ago in 2002. Uh, there are examples that date back in the 1990s of folks doing this. He just really kind of, kind of summarized these designs uh, of, of doing perisurgical trials, window of opportunity trials. Um, they're based upon a concept that was uh, developed out of NCI, Jim Doroshow, uh, which is called a phase zero trial, which is really just a, a, a trial that is focused on pharmacokinetic kinetic or pharmacodynamic endpoints, not clinical endpoints. Uh, for us, it's a little bit different. Uh, because we really have to be using the drugs at their therapeutic concentrations. And the way we do these trials has to be in the setting of a clinically planned procedure. So we think window of opportunity is actually a better term uh, for this. So, so Fred published this in 2002. Um, and Rupa alluded to uh, RANO, uh, which, I, which I helped to start and, and, and co-lead. Um, we decided to, to do uh, a look back in 2020. Uh, it reminds me of one of the uh, former New York mayors who would, used to say, how am I doing, right? So this was, this was sort of the, the point of this 
this study was to say, how are we doing as a field? Uh, and, and this is what we found. Over 25 years, looking just at drug trials, not biologics, just the drug trials, uh, there were only 22 drug trials that included tissue-based analysis of drug levels or biological impact. Um, and yes, a lot of different types of tissues were sampled, but only 50% of the trials used the full clinical dose of the study drug. And anything less than that in our field is just not going to be uh, effective. Um, and then tissue samples from non-enhancing tumor, the true target of the drug, were analyzed in only about 25%. So we're looking at about five or six trials that really looked carefully at the brain, at the infiltrative tumor, to ask whether the drug actually got there. That's not going to do it. That's not going to help us advance our field. Uh, and, and it's important to make that distinction because you know, what's typically sampled is this enhancing tumor, uh, but this is the part here, the non-enhancing tumor, that's what kills the patients. And that's where we have to be getting our drug. Uh, and, and so as we think about this going forward and think about um, what we have to assess in order to understand what's going on, we have to think about this non-enhancing tumor. So, um, you know, we can do this. There are a number of examples of doing this. Uh, this is one that came out of UCSF, um, where they did stereotactically guided biopsies of different parts of the tumor, uh, correlated that with, with radio, uh, radiologic and radiomic uh, analyses, uh, and also with histological studies, to show that there were measurable differences in different parts of just the enhancing tumor. Imagine the non-enhancing part of it, what you might find. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, this is uh, some additional work that, that actually started to also look at this very carefully, uh, doing biopsies in different parts of a tumor uh, and, uh, and characterizing the samples uh, independent of each other. Uh, and with that, they were able to start to develop an ontogeny of this one tumor, how it developed over time and, and, and across space. And they found distinct clones that seemed to arise from prior uh, clones just within the same uh, tumor, uh, which again, speaks to the heterogeneity, speaks to how these tumors evolve over time. And it's information we wouldn't have unless they perform these spatially directed biopsies as opposed to just taking out a whole bunch of tumor and sending it over to pathology. Um, this, this was great work uh, actually. So uh, in coming to, to Moffitt, this is, this is one of the things that I really wanted to build, uh, was the ability to, to geotag, so to speak, our specimens on a routine basis. Uh, and uh, so this is the first of the databases that I've built. We actually have a nice uh, data science team. Uh, and so we've been working on this. So, so this just shows you we can, we can, in any one procedure, we can start annotating each of the samples we take uh, we have an image from our image guidance system, uh, which is um, now linked to that specific sample that we obtained. Uh, we have another sample we took from another part of the tumor. That sample is linked. We can also do this in, in you know, outside of the enhancing area. I just showed two enhancing examples. Uh, and then we have the histological specimens, but more importantly, we have both the paraffin blocks, some frozen samples, and we can also collect the tissue live. Uh, you know, for, for, for appropriate analyses. Uh, and I think this is going to be very important. One of our fellows is currently going through, we now have a couple of hundred samples in this, and is going through and now starting to annotate how many samples we have per case, what locations, uh, and, and we can use that to start feeding into uh, our, our laboratory programs and, and our mathematical oncology programs to really start understanding, better understanding these tumors. We also have a radiomics program here uh, and, uh, and we can start building predictive maps uh, in, into this. Uh, and, and I think that, that ultimately this is, this is gonna be an important tool for us to better characterize uh, you know, the biology of these tumors. But, but also we're doing these window of opportunity trials. Um, and uh, there are a couple I wanna highlight, starting with this uh, cell gene BET inhibitor. Um, uh, and, uh, for those of you who are interested in biology, this is, this is a, a bromodomain, an extra terminal motif is, is involved in epigenetic uh, uh, and, uh, activation of, of uh, tumors, of cancers, and involved in, in regulating MYC activity. Uh, and uh, uh, we were part of a, a phase one study uh, that was designed, again, to assess uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, CNS penetration 
in, uh, in um, uh, recurrent high-grade glioma. And I just presented uh, these initial results uh, at Snow, and we're going to be um, we're going to be uh, putting together the manuscript. Uh, you can see the other the others who are involved. Uh, but what was interesting is um, we measured the drug levels. Now, with the caveat that there's blood there because we're looking in tumor tissue, but we saw a very promising uh, ratio, which is which is higher than what was seen with valiparib, for example, in a, in a similar kind of analysis. Um, we saw that it was higher. Um, but but um, uh, even better, we, we started looking at a marker. So this uh, hexam RNA is a, is a uh, marker uh, that is uh, that runs in tandem uh, with BET inhibition, uh, and you can look at it in blood uh, and uh, uh, and see the see the um, natural course of this after you have BET inhibitor, uh, and then you can look at it in the patients that were in our trial. And this is also in blood, just looking at what happened with this. With this marker, and it and it and it, it you know it um, it moved in a predictable way, uh, and then here's in the tumor tissue. Okay, so this is normalized uh, uh, to the archival tissue, and you can see that the hexam RNA uh, uh, went up uh, in in uh, almost all of the samples that were taken uh, after pretreatment uh, with this drug. So very promising results in that they indicate the drug's getting there, but it's having its uh, expected biological effect. Now, will it have, will that be sufficient for a clinical effect? We don't know yet. This is really a drug that needs to be combined uh, with another therapeutic. So there is actually a study going on now, a phase one study, combining it with uh, temozolomide, uh, and we'll start getting some, some at least safety information from that. And the, the, uh, the efficacy studies are now being planned. But at least we have a, a biological rationale there. Does it guarantee it's going to work? No, but if it doesn't work, at least we know it was getting there to some degree, and, and it's not just that it didn't get there. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, part of the question that I've had in my career is, how can we do better? I mean, you know, IV and oral routes of delivery are great for systemic cancer, uh, but, but really it's, it's very challenging in our disease. Uh, and are there other routes that we can use? Uh, and this is where neurosurgeons have the opportunity to innovate. Uh, and I know there's plenty of that going on uh, there. And, and uh, so I'll just talk, uh, uh, you know, sort of more generally about it and then go into some examples that I've been involved in. Um, so there are a number of ways that you can try to get therapeutics into the brain more effectively. You can manipulate the drugs. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can modify them in a way that they're more brain penetrant, uh, but often they lose their activity. You can try to piggyback on drug and protein transport mechanisms that are known to exist in the brain um, and, and that's been tried, but often they don't work carrying another molecule in. We can alter the blood-brain barrier. We've all been uh, you know, involved to some degree in blood-brain barrier disruption, uh, starting with pharm uh, pharm uh, pharmacologic disruption, osmotic disruption, and now some other modalities that are being developed uh, with focused ultrasound and lit and so on. Um, so far, uh, with the exception of, of CNS lymphoma, that, that's not really uh, shown uh, efficacy and there's been a lot of toxicity along with it. Then of course, there's the idea of direct, direct brain delivery. And the, and the concept, the principle of, of uh, direct brain delivery, I think was validated uh, by the carmustine wafers. It, it showed that you can get an effect. It wasn't a very large effect. And uh, there are many reasons that that technology I think could have been developed further, but unfortunately was not. Um, other ways of doing this, intracavitary infusion, intrathecal, intraventricular injection, that has a limitation of the fact that the CSF space is not in equilibrium uh, with the intraparenchymal space, and there's a very large time gradient there, and, and you may lose your activity of your drug. Uh, and then there's this convection enhanced delivery, which, which you all are undoubtedly familiar with, uh, an idea that, that was initially uh, uh, really pioneered by Ed Oldfield and his team. And the idea is, is to pump a drug slowly into the brain in a way that does not raise intracranial pressure. And now the drug distribution is more dependent upon hydrostatic pressure than on size. Uh, and and this, this cartoon sort of gives an idea of the distribution ex expectations with different modes of delivery. When we inject things in the brain, just a straight injection over you know, a few seconds or a minute, um, that what we see is a large concentration uh, around the end of the needle, but not much else. And, and of course, this is a resection cavity and there's a simulated infiltrated tumor cells. You're not really gonna get very far with that. 
might be appropriate for a replication competent uh, gene therapy or something that, that it you know sort of evokes an immune response, but it's not going to get you very widespread distribution. Uh, and with the um, uh, one of the clinical trials I helped lead, the tokogen study, we actually did some uh, gadolinium uh, mixed with the virus uh, during some of the injections and showed this actually on some very interesting MRIs. Um, with the wafers, uh, again, uh, there's, there's a diffusion mediated delivery. You're gonna have a high concentration at the surface, not much out beyond that. Uh, it was enough for a clinical effect where you're not gonna get much more. And then the idea of convection enhanced delivery is you're gonna get a much more robust delivery. Now it's easy to show that on a, a cartoon like this. Uh, we actually have clinical data supporting that. So what can be delivered? Lots of things. You know, the reality is they really just have to be soluble in water. You really can't put excipients in the brain. Um, so, so there are many different uh, uh, types of molecules, classes of molecules that have been looked at in a variety of studies. These are some of the early studies that were done uh, that had various uh, um, uh, stages of clinical trials, um, uh, but ultimately uh, failed. Uh, and why? Well, the first phase three studies failed because there were a lot of limitations to those trials. We were using the off-the-shelf catheters that were not really ideal. And we also couldn't image where drug was going. It would almost be like trying to do radiation therapy without the symmetry. Uh, never would have made it to where it is today. Uh, and and so, so th these were some of the challenges that we had. Uh, this was an example. Uh, this was actually from John Sampson um, for, for one of the trials where he was able to co-administer radio-labeled albumin. This was such a rare thing at the time to be able to do this. And, and it was just an off-the-shelf catheter that was used. Here it is, uh, the resection cavity is down here. Here's the catheter at 48 hours. You have a very nice distribution of drug. Okay, great. So why would I show this example? Well, most of the catheters looked like this, which was backflow over the surface of the brain, never getting to the target. So you really didn't have drug delivery there. Uh, and that's one reason why the, the trial failed. The drug never got to where it needed to be. Uh, and then, of course, we couldn't uh, image that uh, routinely. We really wanted to be able to do that. We wanted to co-administer gadolinium at the time. There were regulatory barriers to it. Um, we can do it now. And so that's, that's actually become very straightforward. Ultimately, what we found was the devices were not, up to, you know, using off-the-shelf catheters was not going to be adequate. So there was a, a move to develop CED-specific devices. And there are a number of them that are now available, uh, starting with the smart flow MRI interventions uh, cannula. That was actually the pioneer was based upon technology that came out of uh, NIH. Um, and the brain lab is a, is a, um, a flexible version of the same thing. Uh, and then there's this Alcyon, a, a chronic system that's never um, uh, had any regulatory uh, exposure in the US yet. And then the device that I developed, uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, and really, it's it's these, with the exception of the Renishaw and ours, uh, that have 510K uh, uh, clearances. Uh, uh, just to be clear, though, they're not actually approved as CED devices, uh, and the FDA won't do that until there's a drug that's approved for, for direct delivery in a brain parenchyma. Uh, so they're actually cleared for delivery of cytarabine to the ventricles. And I can give a whole talk on regulatory uh, issues another time. Now, you know, this is sort of like bringing Coles to Newcastle. You guys know about this. There's some fantastic work going on uh, that, that's looking at CED for brainstem glioma. And one of the, one of the brilliant things about this approach is that it's a theragnostic. Uh, and, and you can see where the therapeutic is going. You can measure it. You know what you're delivering. Uh, I wish all drugs could be like this, um, but, but they're not. Uh, but this is, this is beautiful work uh, and, and uh, really has a lot of, lot of promise. Um, but for what we're doing, it's not brainstem glioma for adults. For adults, it's treating this infiltrative component. That is really the thing because you know this, this enhancing part, we have a treatment for it, we take it out. It's down here, it's this area that we need to be treating. Um, and, and actually, um, you know, most of the uh, devices that were developed like the uh, uh, smart flow cannula, the brain lab cannula, the Alcyon cannula, they were really focused on localization of delivery. And the reason is that the people who are developing it were really focused on Parkinson's and neurodegenerative disorders, where they had very small targets where they needed to have very accurate localization. Brain tumors, you don't really need that. Um, and, and you're really limited to only about three and a half cc's of delivery uh, if, if you're using a device that can only be used in the OR and can't be left in place for hours or days. Uh, so so um, 
coverage of infiltrating tumor is actually a volume challenge. It's not a localization challenge. And uh, this was work actually, Matt Grabowski, who knows and is now on faculty at Cleveland Clinic, when he was a medical student did this with me, where we were looking at recurrent GVMs and, and measuring volumes, you know, extent of resection and like, we actually looked at the, uh, the T2 part and the median uh, in these patients was around 37 cc's. That's a large volume you have to cover. You're not gonna cover it with a single, single uh, lumen uh, device. And that's what led to the development of this device. Um, uh, we, we started actually developing this internally, uh, came up with some ideas for this, this design, uh, hand-built prototypes validated in my lab, uh, and, uh, and then ultimately we partnered with a, a, a real company, Parker Hannafin, that, that is a global manufacturer. Um, this uh, spinoff company, Infusion, we created uh, actually in the, the clinic, would do spinoffs where they own them, uh, the inventors couldn't own it. So, so uh, that's the way it was set up. Uh, we have uh, several patents. We actually have some more than this, and we have the 510K clearance. But the idea behind this device was a single catheter, four different delivery ports, maximizing our exposure from a single pass. Uh, that was really the idea. Um, and it's one thing to actually develop a device and say it's going to be better. It's another thing to actually prove it. Uh, and uh, being a clinician, I, you know, to me, I, I really needed to see that it was going to work before we really started doing more with it. Uh, so we developed this, um, this study it was uh, really intended as a proof of delivery, but of course we wanted to deliver a therapeutic. Uh, and again, uh, we, we piggybacked on some great work that was being done by Jeff Bruce with Topotica. Uh, uh, ultimately the FDA, when they look at this, they're looking at what's the mode of action. Uh, and so they regulated this under an IND. Uh, and, and I wanted to make that as simple as possible. So I just pointed to Jeff's uh, publication and said, we're gonna use the same dose, same infusion time, same everything, except with our device. Uh, and they said, great. And, and the focus of the regulation uh, of the, of the uh, IND was then on the device, not on the drug. Uh, in fact, the biggest challenge was actually trying to get the two divisions of the FDA to talk to each other. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. But, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was actually um, uh, very, very challenging. Uh, to do that, but the rest of it was very straightforward. So we developed uh, this and, and you know, I published part of it uh, where we're doing initial validation. Uh, one of the questions we asked uh, was an obvious one. If we use those same parameters uh, in enhancing tumor versus tumor infiltrated brain, will we get the same result in, the, in terms of the volume of distribution? And the answer was a resounding no, as expected. When you deliver an enhancing tumor, you have a very high efflux of drug out of the tumor because you have a leaky blood-brain barrier. When you deliver in non-enhancing tumor where the barrier is intact, the drug's gonna stay there longer. And that's what this showed very clearly. And we stopped after three patients because there was no point in doing this. We really wanted to focus on the non-enhancing uh, uh, tumor. And so that's what we did with the, with the next study. Uh, now we started seeing volumes of distribution that were quite impressive uh, and start getting in that ballpark of what we were expecting for the volume of infiltrative tumor after you resect a tumor. Um, this just shows a resection cavity and two of the catheters, and this was the coverage that we got uh, with one of the patients. So now we're really in a position where we can start to treat that part of the tumor, and that was really the goal of this. Um, now, that's not to say we're, we're not interested in enhancing tumor. We actually have a trial open here uh, at Moffitt, where we're going back to the enhancing tumor and saying, what if we increase the rate of delivery? Initially, we couldn't really do that. We needed to match the parameters from, from Jeff Bruce's study. Uh, but now the FDA said, fine, go ahead. And we've increased it to, to the point where we can overcome. There's no IV gadolinium in this image. This is all gadolinium that's co-infused with topotecan. And we've been able to cover uh, the, uh, um, the enhancing tumor uh, with that. Uh, so so uh, that's, that's actually pretty exciting. Um, now, is topotecan the best drug? I don't know, but, but ultimately what I wanted to get into was developing new drugs uh, that, that might be more ideal uh, for, for treating uh, GBM. Uh, and so uh, this is a partnership uh, with a company called Oncosynergy, uh, who's developing a therapeutic antibody uh, against the uh, uh, against CD29, which is the master integrin subunit. Uh, and we're doing a first in human study with them. And now we can actually combine the two different principles I talked about, having a window of opportunity trial plus a delivery trial into one single trial. So we are taking patients with recurrent GBM, and I'll show you on the next 
on the next slide here, we're taking uh, patients with recurrent GBM, we're doing a, a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis, and at that time, putting a single catheter into the enhancing tumor. We're then delivering over four hours this antibody, uh, and then two days later, taking them back for their clinically indicated resection uh, and taking the tumor out. We now have tumor tissue, and we can look at the biological effects of that antibody. And then we're placing two more catheters into the tumor infiltrated brain and delivering to that area uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, so that's a study that's, that's currently open. Um, and we've treated three patients uh, since February. Uh, and, um, and we have an accelerated uh, uh, dose escalation design. Uh, and uh, so far, it's going well. Now, the big challenge we have is that, um, uh, believe it or not, supply chain. Uh, so the catheters, um, when, we, when we make them, are, are good on the shelf for two years. Um, and two years uh, for the last batch ended last week, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and we actually started earlier this year the process of ordering some new catheters. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's when we hit up against the supply chain issue. So everything about the catheters is available and the manufacturer is ready to make the whole thing except for the stylet. They can't get the material for the stylet and it's gonna take till early next year before we have more catheters, which is just driving me crazy. Uh, but that, that is actually the real implications of, of what we're facing right now. Uh, and they can't just switch out materials, unfortunately. Uh, so we're, we're kind of stuck until those come. We're actually going to, we're, we're, we're actually planning to uh, use another catheter in the meantime, one that might be available uh, in order to keep this going. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll be back in action with, with our device. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, it's, it's easy to say neuro-oncology is plagued by failure to learn from failure. We have a lot of it but we don't learn from it as, as effectively as we should. Uh, and so we have this, this one mechanism, the window of opportunity trials that, that help give us a, a chance to better understand the biological effects of our treatments and whether or not they have a chance of working at least. Uh, and then, then ultimately though, uh, I think that neurosurgeons as scientists, we should be developing therapeutics. We should be engaging with our, uh, our laboratory and translational partners uh, to be developing therapeutics um, and, and to me, the focus is really on that part that we cannot remove uh, surgically. Um, now, of course, none of this can be done without a large team. This is, this is you know, I, I have another slide from Cleveland Clinic, but this is my current team at, at, at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, as, as Rupa may be aware, I've always had a series of, of license plates where, where I like to, to talk about what I'm doing. So, you know, stopping cancer in, in your head. Uh, and now, of course, uh, we have to deliver. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm hoping to be able to do uh, in general. And I'll, I'll finally leave you with a few images uh, from Champa. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone has a million questions. Um, just to start with some of the work you were talking with last with respect to the tree resect treat. Two questions. One, you know, it's, it's pretty understandable in a recurrent setting um, that, you know, you, we would want tissue. And so it's pretty justifiable to do a biopsy and then treat and ultimately resect. Um, obviously much harder to do in the upfront setting. Do you see us as a field sort of being able to justify that um, in order to help move forward? Because, you know, understand that's, that's been our, our biggest limitation, but Ultimately, if we keep stagnating there, um, you know, we have to have some kind of paradigm shift. Um, yes, I, you know, I think it is more challenging the upfront study, uh, setting, as you said, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was uh, starting my career, um, there were a number of um, uh, patients I'd see who would come in having had a biopsy uh, and, then, and then come in for a resection. Uh, or even, you know, even back then there were some, some of my partners would, would uh, biopsy a, a mass first. And then when they confirmed it was GBM, go ahead and take it out. Um, you know, that's a setting where you can at least have some baseline tissue. I don't do that anymore. I, you know, if there's something, you know, if it looks like it's a GBM, we're going to resect it. We just resect it. I don't, I don't do an initial biopsy. So the upfront setting is going to be more challenging. Usually you're not going to be doing early stage um, uh, studies though in terms of validating delivery uh, in the upfront setting. That's probably better suited for the recurrent setting. Um, remember, you know, you're starting with a new drug 
you don't know what all of the risks are going to be. You don't know what you know whether or not it's going to um, uh, be delivered effectively. You really want to have um, you know you really want to understand what is your question there. And if it's a biological question, if it's a target oriented question, that's probably better done in the in the recurrent setting. Um, you know, upfront you have other variables as well. You're going to have your chemo radiation, uh, and you're not going to do. In general, we're not doing pure phase zero studies where it's just administering the drug, looking for effect, and then you're done, uh, as opposed to then, you know, treating therapeutic with therapeutic intent. Um, you know, that's more what we're going to do in our field. So better you do that in the recurrent setting initially, uh, get your biological data, get some initial clinical data, uh, because when you come up front, then you have to, you have to uh, sort of take into account uh, the effects of radiation and, chemo and, and you know, temozolomide chemotherapy and interactions there. So, so I think these are all very separable questions and we need to use the right setting for each of those questions. Great, thank you. Hey Mike, it's Jeff Bruce here, how are you? Uh, uh, how are you doing Jeff? Th thanks for a great talk. As you know, I've been a, a, a followed your uh, work very closely. I've been a great fan of all the great contributions you've made. So thanks for, for sharing that today. Uh, I have one comment and then a question. Um, you know, we in our recurrent uh, glioma trials, we've found that there's at least a 10 to 20% uh, uh, incidence of pseudo progression. So we actually have a, a recent protocol, which was approved, which depended on a biopsy first to confirm that you actually have active tumor. So I, th I think there's justification for a, a tissue biopsy before, before treatment and, and then your ability to look at a treatment afterwards because uh, you know, literally somewhere between 10 to 20% of patients are gonna be, gonna be rejected from that trial. Um, my question is a little bit more broad one. Uh, you know, we, your, your work with industry is really, I, th I think is essential if we're gonna move forward with a lot of these technological advances and can you just speak broadly about, you know, the problems you've had with conflict of interest and in universities and, and industry? I mean, you, you want to do something with an NIH grant, it takes five years plus an additional year to, to uh, get the grant funded. Whereas industry, uh, you know, you, you have motivated partners who will, who will make things happen. How do you, how, how, what's your experience been like uh, reconciling that? Yeah, so so that's that's a very important point. Uh, I think when whenever you think about therapeutic development, um, and and I've been fortunate uh, to have had um, very pragmatic partners in this. Um, and and you know, I, I honestly I wouldn't have come to Moffitt if I, if I didn't think I could continue doing it. So it started at the the, the clinic when when we we had to address these things. You know, as I said, the clinic owns its startups, um, so the institution is conflicted. And then, of course, there's the inventor investigator who's conflicted, and I hold the IND on, on those studies. Um, so there's all, all sorts of potential conflicts, but um, they, they understand that. These are, these are you know, the, the leadership understands that and, and um, uh, developed, I think, what was a rational policy uh, in terms of managing the conflicts. Um, and, you know, it, it really, it, it's very individualized to the situation. So, if this were a drug that be, could be given IV or a pill, anything like that, um, I, I would not be um, treating those patients, okay? And, and maybe there's even a question of whether or not I'd be PI in the study. Um, but that's not what this is. This is a technical development. And when it comes to uh, technology, um, uh, that was exactly the discussion was, there was an understanding that early stage technology development requires the hand of the inventor. Uh, and so in the conflict management plan, uh, the way we managed it was, was to say that I would um, treat, you know, they'd start, I'd, we started with the first five patients. Uh, and then we'd have a discussion to see whether or not I needed to continue. Uh, if we were changing things around and exploring changes, you know, and the like, then, then I could potentially continue treating the patients Otherwise, I needed to bring others in to do the treatment, and I could just, you know, serve as their, as the quote unquote sponsor for this, because I was a sponsor investigator. Uh, you know, the, the official uh, designation is sponsor investigator, um, and uh, and it turned out that you know we we were actually pretty good by patient number two, maybe patient number three, and so at that point I started training my colleagues to do it, and I just would go in and I'd supervise. Um, when I came to Moffitt, 
um, which does not have a, uh, a long tradition of surgical innovation. Uh, you know, I discussed this with them and, and, uh, um, uh, and they asked, okay, how'd you do it at, at Cleveland Clinic? And I explained how, and they said, oh, uh, can you show us that conflict management policy? I said, sure. And they said, uh, they put a Moffitt letterhead on it and it's now my Moffitt uh, conflict management policy. Um, I, don't, I don't treat the patients uh, when, when my device is being used. Uh, I may see the patients in clinic and then if that's something that's an option, they see one of my partners, I've, I've, I've trained them to do this. I'm there for the cases uh, because I need to, I need to uh, do oversight. Although I find that I'm, I'm not there as much for the case as I, I used to be. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's because uh, uh, I, I really don't need to. I mean, my partner's really good. And, and the one who's been doing most of the cases is really good. And, 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 and I just need to be there to make sure that you know, certain things were done and re recorded and that's it. Um, so, so that's ideal to me because you know, I can't be doing all of these. I mean, that's not, that's not a viable path for developing uh, innovation, you have to you have to be able to, you know, uh, uh, develop it initially, and then be able to train people and get them to continue uh, to develop the the, the technology. Uh, so in those situations, I think it's been it's been very rational uh, and pragmatic. I, I know there are places that um, take a, a much harder line on this, uh, and I consider myself fortunate uh, not to be at one of those places. Uh, by the way, Jeff, um, uh, please please publish those data about the 10 to 20 percent uh, um, pseudo progression rate. I would, I would love it; it'd be very useful. As I mentioned earlier, I, I used uh, your publication to get our study through the FDA faster. Uh, I would love to be able to use your 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 paper on on uh, pseudo progression uh, to be able to continue to justify doing the the biopsy uh, treat and and uh, and then and then uh, resect uh, protocol. Sure, great, thanks. So just one last question. Um, we talked a lot about tumor heterogeneity and you know the sampling multiple areas, which I think you know we all understand as surgeons. Given the evolution of work being done with liquid biopsy and cell-free DNA, and you know, where do you see that ever getting to the point where we can adequately reflect the heterogeneity of the tumors that we're treating in order to supplant some of the, the actual um, sampling so that, you know, for example, we could track uh, treatment response, we could track uh, delivery in, a, in an earlier setting without necessarily needing the tissue. Yeah, that, you know, that's actually a great question, uh, Ruba, because you're anticipating, uh, you're anticipating um, some of the challenges or some of the, the potential, uh, actually, for some of the liquid biopsy approaches. You know, the, the some of the challenge with liquid biopsy is, is um, you know, detection. First of all, being able to detect very, very tiny quantities and, and see that over noise. Um, uh, and, then, and then secondly, how well does it track tumor burden? And, um, and that, I, I don't think we really understand that yet. And, um, but then when you ask the question of heterogeneity, can you start to resolve subclones in whatever liquid biopsy approach you're using, if it's like a cell-free DNA or, 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 or some other, you know, uh, vesicles, microvesicles, uh, you know, are you going to be able to detect heterogeneity there? You know, I don't know. I think those are all interesting areas of exploration. Uh, ultimately, there has to be validation against the gold standard um, uh, to be able to know how much of a, uh, how much you can use that for diagnostic purposes to be able to track uh, you know, tumor uh, evolution, recurrence, and so on. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting work, but, you know, uh, so far it remains exploratory for the most part. Great. Thank you. So if, ever, if uh, no one else has any questions, I just you know, want to say thank you so much for a wonderful talk. The residents are really eagerly looking forward to speaking with you as well. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to give you a little bit of a break and then uh, feel free to join back. But uh, thank you uh, for your visit to New York City virtually, and we hope to see you in person sometime soon. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Have a good evening. I'll stay on, uh, Rupa. Uh, okay, great. Uh,
You need you sure you don't need a break? Oh yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Come on, a one hour talk? That's easy. Well, our uh, our typical ground rounds are only 45 minutes. So we asked for an hour plus another, you know, half hour, 45 right. minutes with residents. So it seems like quite a long time. No, study section, that's a long time. <laughs> So it looks like uh, we're getting down to mostly the resident group. Um, Brett is sort of the uh, my correlate over at Columbia, so I'll let him introduce himself, and then I, I would love if the residents can all uh, meet you as individually as possible. <laughs> yes, hi, Brett Youngerman. I'm a junior faculty uh, over at Columbia and help coordinate the grand rounds with, with Rupa. Nice to meet you. Great. Nice to meet you. I think this is great that you guys are doing it together like this. It's, it's, uh, it's nice. One of the few perks of, of Zoom, we've been able to get this going. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it would have been possible. We had thought about it even before, but it, uh, it sort of was impossible with our schedules and how we're uh, geographically not too far away, but we might as well be ta in Tampa and New York City. <laughs> right. No, I know. Um, I see the Columbia residents there in a group. Introduce themselves, yeah. Hi there, I'm Evan Joyner. I'm one of the PGY5s. Great. I'm Michael, I'm a medical student. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm John. I'm a PGY6 going into endovascular and uh, skull base. Great. I'm uh, Eleanor, a PGY5 going into endovascular and uh, vascular. Wonderful. Great. Nice to meet you. I'm uh, Matei. I'm uh, a PGY6 uh, going into oncology, uh, MD Anderson Fellowship. Okay, just just to just to remind you, I think I alluded to the fact that we have fellows. Okay, we have two fellows a year, <laughs> fast certified. I saw I saw it at Snow. I saw it at Snow. Yeah. I saw it. There was yeah. everywhere announcing yeah. it. Yep. Yeah, and the, the the weather the weather is actually better in Tampa than Houston. Okay, I Definitely. know you're locked in right there. But for your for your fellow residents, please uh, you know keep it in mind. Awesome, thank you. I'm Evan. I'm a PGY six at Cornell. Also going into oncology. Also will be uh, Matei's co fellow <laughs> at MT Anderson. Hi, I'm Gary. Um, PGY four at Cornell, uh, doing my infolded endovascular fellowship. Great. Hi, I'm, I'm Mari Cruz. I'm a PGY4 at Cornell, and I'm going to go into neuro-oncology. Wonderful. And I see this guy, Vikram. Vikram, are you still on? I think he may I be guess. walking home. He just finished a case over here at MSK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I actually have one question just uh, based on your CED work. Uh, I've worked with Dr. Swedan on, on some of his CED trial data. And one of the things that we have struggled with is how to assess outcomes in terms of progression, especially with invasive diseases and when CED only covers certain uh, areas. So are you, how are you, uh, you know, accounting for progression outside of the treated field versus inside of the treated field in your study? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, you know, we're, we're co-infusing gadolinium uh, with ours. So we do have an idea of where, where the therapeutic has gone. So, you know, if it's outside of that, then, then we can be fairly confident. It's inside that's more the challenge. We, we actually had a patient um, on the Oncosynergy trial who progressed. And when I compared his infusion to the new MRI that looked like progression, it, it was just absolutely overlapping. And I thought, holy cow, this is, this, this might just be treatment effect, right? So we actually took that patient to surgery uh, and it turned out it was actually tumor. Uh, so, you know, I, I think those are, those are still reasonable questions. Now, when you're talking about brainstem gliome, a little harder just to go on biopsy and the like, I, I, I get that. But, you know, we, we certainly can do that with the super tutorial cases uh, and, uh, um, or, you know, the hemisphere cases. Um, uh, and, and, and I think it was an important thing that we did that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I, I want to just build on a point uh, that Dr. Bruce made about the 10 to 20 percent uh, recurrence of being pseudo progression. Uh, I really want that publication for obvious strategic reasons, but the reality is, is most of them are actually uh, progression. Um, and uh, it's just, it, it may just be a sampling error thing. There, there is another RANO effort being done now, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, looking at this question of what constitutes pathologic uh, classification of recurrence versus pseudo progression. Um, uh, and the folks at, at Columbia are quite involved uh, in that in that effort. So, so you know, I think I think that that's still an open question, and it's an important one uh, that speaks to your your question as well, Evan, uh, and uh, um, and just the general general issue of using uh, radiographic endpoints. Um, we use them because we we, we really want nearer term uh, indicators so that we can you know adjust what we're doing. Uh, but there's always a lot of risk with that uh, and, and challenges. And, and we just have to, you know, I think the idea of getting getting tissue is, is probably more important than not getting it. I have a couple of questions, uh, Eleanor, here. Um, uh, two questions. One, do you know, um, one, when you do convection enhanced delivery of a drug and gadolinium, do you know how the washout happens? Where does actually the drug and the gadolinium go? Uh, considering that you don't have to cross the blood brain barrier there, you're already asked to do it. Great question. Yeah, great question. I, I did not give the whole, my whole usual talk on CD on the basic principles, just as a matter of time, I wanted to include a few other things. Um, but, you know, in the end, um, there's this thing called, that we call volume and distribution. <clears throat> and volume and distribution is, is dependent upon uh, two factors, and that is your rate of infusion, uh, or influx and your rate of efflux. Uh, and, um, uh, and so one can draw a curve, it's a three-dimensional plot that, that shows what the expected volume of distribution is depending upon your, your influx rate and your efflux rate, because you know, it's really just, it's, it's a combination of the two. It's, it's just a sim simple math. Um, and uh, so what are the factors that impact on your efflux rate? Well. You know, one of them is whether or not the barrier is open. That's why I was saying an enhancing tumor, we expect more rapid efflux. But it depends upon the same principles of the drugs as, um, as what keeps them out of the brain. So molecules that are uh, likely to be PGP, um, uh, ABC uh, transporter cassette, you know, uh, ABC uh, uh, cassette transporter uh, proteins 